my name's Adam. I'm, I was born in India, then I grew up in Canada. Uh, actually, I also spent about 10 years in Kenya, in Africa, then Canada, and then now I've been here in Taiwan almost 20 years. So I, I teach English part-time, and then I also have a website teaching Chinese to, to foreigners. Interesting. Teach Chinese. Yeah. So I guess your Chinese must be very good. I would say it's, it's functional. It's at like an intermediate level. But most Chinese, I mean, most foreigners who come here, when they start their Chinese is at a beginner level. So if I can get them even just to like a functional day-to-day -day level, I think that's still beneficial to them. To start with, um, how, how do you learn to speak Chinese? Because in Canada, you have a lot of immigrants who come from other countries and they, they can't speak English when they come to Canada. But then after living there for, you know, six months, a year, you know, their English is pretty good. They can communicate. So I assumed just by living in Taiwan, you know, being in a Chinese speaking place, you know, just live there for a year. So slowly you'll pick up. So when I first came, I was teaching, so I didn't bother trying to learn Chinese. I just tried to pick up on the side. But then after a year in, I found I could still just barely, I could say ni hao and sai jian and stuff. So then I thought maybe there's something wrong with me. So then I started to do more research and then I found because Chinese is much more difficult. So you actually have to put some effort into it. Because I was teaching English, that was, um, I would teach at a high school during the day and then in the evenings I had cram schools to go to. So I didn't want to attend any classes because that's my teaching time. So I tried to learn on the side pick up books and CDs and whatever I could find at the time to learn um, by myself. Taiwan, I'd say, is different from going to like Hong Kong or Thailand or those kind of places that are more tourist friendly. And there you'll see, you know, a lot of people who can speak English and a lot more kind of foreign friendly food and those type of things. Whereas Taiwan is a little bit off that path. So when you come here, you're getting more of a taste of Taiwanese culture. So here you won't find as many people who, you can't assume that anyone here speaks English. You may go to Chinese restaurants and things that have no English on the menu and stuff. So some people like that because then you get to experience the real culture. Whereas for other people who expect wherever you go, people can speak English and there'll be English menus and stuff, they might be disappointed. So as long as you're okay with that, then by all means, if you're, you know, you wanted to learn Chinese, then this is definitely one of the best places to be for that. So actually what happened is when I first, as I mentioned earlier, I was trying to learn Chinese on the side and I found most of the materials were designed by native Chinese speakers, which makes sense. But then how they learned the language is different than how I as a foreigner or as an English speaker, uh, my experience is different. So as I was learning the language, many times I was thinking, if I was teaching this, I wouldn't teach it like that. Don't even talk about this. Focus on this. And I just, so I, it just kept going in the back of my head. And then the other thing is while I was here teaching, my background is actually computer science in Canada. That was my degree. So while I enjoyed teaching here, I knew, well, this doesn't really have anything to do with my degree. But then also I thought if I go back to Canada and just get a job in computers, then my whole experience in Taiwan will kind of disappear. I'm not going to use Chinese in Canada. Even I'm not going to be teaching English to anybody there. So I was thinking if there was a way to kind of combine like technology with teaching. And so then as I was looking, I thought, well, what if I could teach Chinese the way I wish somebody had taught me? The idea be behind that site, because it, it seems a bit strange when people look at me and they say, oh, so you teach English? I say, well, I teach Chinese. And then they say, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Do you work alone or do you work with Taiwanese? And I think 2006 is when I first started. So I created a website, a podcast, where uh, I would kind of design the curriculum, but then I would get native Chinese speakers to do the actual speaking. I didn't want people to learn the speaking from me. I was just designing the course. This is how I want to be taught. Mm -hmm. And then I even hired like university teachers to look over the curriculum to make sure all the grammar and those type of things are correct. But then I would tell them, this is what I want you. And I would write out all the scripts and those type of things and get them to check it. And so I put it out there. I said, well, let's see if, you know, anybody likes it. And then I got a lot of positive feedback like, oh, wow, you know, because they can 
I'm kind of teaching the, as if I'm the customer, which I was. So I'm teaching someone the way I want to be taught. Mm -hmm. So then uh, people like that. It's a different approach. And in fact, since then, people of local Taiwanese have asked me, can you make a course like yours teaching English? And then I said, well, for the same reason I can't, because I don't know what your needs are, right? As, a, as learning English as a second language from a Chinese background, uh, mm -hmm. I can only create what I know. So in a sense, I feel that's kind of the benefit of the site. It's, it's I'm creating, you know, I'm the main user. I create what works for me, and if it works for me, then there'll be other people like me mm -hmm. who can benefit from it. Wow, this is uh, very unique and special. I've never heard of a foreigner yeah. teaching um, Chinese too. <laughs> mm -hmm. What's the name of your website? So it's called ChineseTrack.com, T-R-A-C-K. There's um, a website, there's also an app in for iPhones, Android, everything's there. Chinese truck. Okay, uh, the link will be in the description below. You can um, go check them out. During your stay here, what do you find special, unique, or unusual? So again, back in Canada, when you have immigrants who come there, they're kind of treated as a lower level from the regular society. Like, oh, you know, you're from your country, learn English, and it feels like they're at the, treated as a lower level they make less money. But then here, it's, it's like the opposite. As a foreigner, like we're paid more than the Taiwanese teachers and, and people here are very friendly and nice to the foreigners. So I kind of like that. And in fact, every time I would go back to Canada, there I'm just treated like a normal person, whereas here I kind of feel special and different. So I kind of like that. So that's two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, yes, if, it depends how you look at it, right? So if you want to be different and you want to be special, so in my case, that's the side I focus on. Whereas there's other people maybe who want to, who've lived here for a long time and they want to be treated like Taiwanese because of the demographics and, you know, everybody kind of looks the same. So, I mean, even if you were, if I was to get Taiwanese citizenship and everything, I would never be considered Taiwanese. So I get that, that, that just comes with the situation. Living in or being from India, lived in Canada, yeah. and now in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. What stands out most about Taiwan? We say it's a very like homogeneous society in the terms of, like I said, everyone kind of looks the same and speaks the same language. And whereas coming from Canada, it's so different where there's immigrants from around the world. So when you're out, you hear lots of different languages and even food and things. There's, I find there's a much bigger variety there. So in that sense, it, it's quite different here. But then one benefit for there is uh, of being here when everybody is kind of similar, the values, if, you know, where they're good, they tend to be broadcast across society. So things like when you're on the MRT, everyone follows the rules, right? They line up properly. When you're going up the escalator, everyone stands on the right side. Like you don't really see that in other countries because you have people from around the world who have their own rules and their own ways of thinking and stuff like that. There's good and bad to all these situations. But in that case, I find Taiwan to be very different from Canada. And, and then also I find it super safe, right? So many times I'm on my scooter, I'll forget my key in the scooter, and at the end of the day I come, the key is still there. Or I can just leave my helmet, I don't have to protect it. Or even if I'm at a coffee shop, I want to go to the bathroom, I could just leave my phone on the table go to the bathroom, come back, I don't have to worry, anybody's going to take it. Whereas in other countries, you know, you can't do that, right? People, you have to worry about your money, somebody's going to try to steal it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I find Taiwan to be super safe. Um, also, I have two small kids going to elementary school. So even for them, I don't have to worry about, you know, safety and things like that. So in that sense, you know, I really like that part about Taiwan. How is it like raising kids here in Taiwan? So my kids, uh, their mom is Taiwanese. So they they have a mixed background, so with Chinese and English. So when they were small, like I would speak to them in English and their mom would speak to them in Chinese. Uh, so they're getting kind of this dual background that even in their school, they're in local school, it's all in Chinese. And then when they come home, everything is in English. So actually, before they were born, I was actually worried that I thought, well, I'll be the only one speaking to them in English, whereas the rest of the world here in Taiwan will all be in Chinese. So maybe I'll be at a disadvantage, whereas I wanted their level to be equal, their Chinese and their English. 
but then actually now like my son's finishing grade six and his English is actually better than his Chinese but uh, that's not because of me it's because in my house like all the technology YouTube Netflix everything is all in English, all in English so yeah. they actually learn more from that than they do you know in school and things so I think it's been a good balance of, of both worlds for them having a kid learning both English and Chinese, what advice would you give to parents who wanted to push their kids to learn English? If you can get them interested in, in subjects uh, that they enjoy in the target language, that's beneficial. So a lot of kids today, for example, play like Roblox and those type of games that are, a lot of, a lot of it is in English. Mm -hmm. So maybe they even watch YouTube videos related to that. And if it's all in English, then they're kind of forced to, to learn that, but it's in a subject that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're kind of forcing them to take content that they have no interest in, then you know there's no purpose. So ideally, find some subject that they enjoy, and then where they're kind of, okay, I have to learn this language to really consume that, consume that, that content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in my case, that's what has worked out. And here, you know, some of the things it's hard to do is teaching English here, when you have a class of like 30 people in the class, it's hard to give assignments like write an essay on this or tell me which, where all the answers are different because then as a teacher, you're not going to grade 30 different papers that are completely different answers. So here they tend to do like multiple choice where there's only one right answer. And so the thinking is a little bit different right here. So even when we're teaching English, we teach, uh, okay, if I say, how are you? What's the reply? The reply is, I'm fine, thanks, and you? There's no other reply. That's the only <laughs> reply. Whereas, of course, maybe you're not so good. Maybe you're happy, you're sad. There could be many other answers and things. But that's what people are kind of used to. Here's a question, and there's only one right answer. Whereas in life, of course, there could be many different answers depending on the situation. So as, as a student, it's good to get kind of a broad aspect you can learn what you can from school, but then hopefully on the side, you're learning on your own to match your own personality, and so you can kind of broaden your horizons. New horizons, yeah. What advice would you give to Taiwanese who wishes to go to India? It's actually a good matchup because uh, Taiwanese are very good at making hardware, right? Computer hardware, whereas India specializes in software. Um, the problem, I would think, though, is, is the, the language you know, the communication between Indians and Taiwanese. So if you can, if they can bridge that and focus on improving their English and communi communicating, then I think uh, it, it's a good match. India is kind of a funny place though, because as a country, there's many different states and each state has a different language. And then there's the national language, Hindi, and then there's English. So for Indians growing up, even if you never move from your small town, Usually you'll speak three languages, right? Your local language, then the national language, and you'll learn English. So, and many people move to different states so they can speak multiple languages and things. Wow. And also the food and things is of course, I think Taiwanese like Indian food because there's lots of Indian restaurants here. Mm -hmm. So India is definitely a very interesting place and if your business or something can benefit from that, it's certainly something worth exploring. Mm -hmm. I find it's India is either a place you love it or you hate it. Like there's nothing <laughs> in between. <laughs> the last time I went to India, I had gone to a movie theater there just to watch. It was like Spider-Man or something. And it was quite interesting. Like during the action scenes, people would be cheering and stuff. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, they would all clap. So it was as if they were watching a live performance. It seemed quite Yeah, very, quite inter interesting. very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> different part of the world, different Definitely. interesting things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and even when I went uh, like clubbing and stuff to, to dances, people would sing loudly to the songs and do like the group dance and things. So yeah, very different culture. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give to anyone who wishes to come to Taiwan? Any foreigners I know who've been here for an extended period of time who don't speak much Chinese, and it's possible to get by with just you could go to foreign restaurants, you could eat at McDonald's, and you could go to places where people can speak English. And then if you're teaching English, I mean, you could live here for a long time, not even having to speak Chinese. But I think to get to a deeper level, like you have the benefit of being out here. So if you want to be able to communicate with locals and find out more about them and whatnot, 
then I think learning Chinese is important. And then also not having to depend on locals all the time. Oh, I have to, you know, phone my landlord because this is not working. So they have to call a Taiwanese friend. Can you call and ask him for this? So, I mean, if you can do some of that on your own, then it kind of increases your independence. So that's kind of the challenge, I think, with most foreigners is how good can you get your Chinese ability to be? The more you can speak, kind of the more you can experience, the more you can do on your own. Mm -hmm. Whereas the faster you can learn Chinese, the more you can expand your social circles and you know, get to know more people. So that's probably what I'd recommend. Do you have anything else to tell Taiwanese people? Uh, no, just uh, you've, you've done a, a great job. It's kind of hard, but when you have a lot of people in a small place, so things like traffic and you know, pedestrian safety and stuff is, is still a bit of an issue. So I have my kids going to school and coming back. So I worry some places there's no sidewalk, so they have to walk on the street and you know, cars and scooters are going you know, very close to them. So it would be nice if that part could be improved. And I think the government has done some parts to improve that safety, um, but still some ways to go. Uh, so that's, I think, the, the part that's kind of challenging. I think traffic safety, hopefully that can keep improving to the part. So when I say Taiwan's very safe, yes, I agree. That would be the one area that I still feel a little bit nervous about. That's another thing I find many times Taiwanese see foreigners, but they're kind of shy to come talk to them. Maybe they think, oh, their English is not good enough or something. But uh, even if you come say hi, or if that's all you can do. Uh, we feel the same way sometimes we're here and we want to talk to you, but we're also shy. So, you know, be, you can be even more friendly. Come. So for me personally, people sometimes come talk to, them, talk to me on the street to practice English, whatever. I love it. It's great. So keep doing that. All right. Thank you very much. And hope you continue to flourish here in Taiwan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much